Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, Tina Brock here, your host for Into the Absurd. And for the next 50 to 60 minutes, we're going to talk about films with Dan Scully, who is a humorist. He's a script doctor, he's a filmmaker, and he is a writer, and he's a film critic. And we're going to talk all about your favorite films. So put your questions in the chat box over there if you're joining us on Zoom or if you're coming in on Facebook Live as well. And thanks for being here with us on this lovely, lovely day. Dan Scully uh, has been a stand-up guy doing stand-up literally for many years and has recently made a more or less transition into film. Uh, into film. We're going to talk more about that if stand-up is still a part of his repertoire. And he is writing for cinema76.com, uh, moviejohn.com, and cindy.com, and we're gonna and many others. So we'll talk about that, and maybe best just to get Dan to the table and begin this conversation about films. Dan Scully, welcome to Into the Absurd. All right. Okay. Am I unmuted? Hello. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I'm not the most tech savvy guy in the world. I can work a keyboard, but uh, this kind of stuff is, is sometimes touchy for me. Yeah, no, you're in and in and shining. Let's hey, talk about, shine. yeah, let's talk about, um, in the introduction, I, I wasn't actually clear, so I stumbled a little bit on the, um, are you, are you still in the stand-up comedy world have you i am not for good? You, you got pretty much it? transitioned uh i love doing stand-up i did it for a very very long time and uh i think i made peace with the fact that in order to make it in the world of stand-up there is a level of devotion and work that uh as i get older i was not prepared to do uh there is a reason that middle-aged stand-up comedians all kind of look the same and it's because years and years of staying up until two in the morning for stage time and getting drunk many nights out of the week starts to take its toll. And I just couldn't couldn't hack it anymore. And uh, about the time that I, uh, you know, got gainfully employed and started leaning into writing and fell into a relationship and became happy, uh, stand up started to kind of fade out a little bit. But I, I think that humor is always going to be uh, my main tool of communication in any sort of writing that I do. Um, but I will say that everybody on the planet should try stand up at least once. It's it's the great equalizer. I was just going to say it seems extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult. And of course, you hear that. Um, but what was the hardest part of it for you? I think the hardest part about stand up is that you know, it's, it's your job as a comedian that no matter who the crowd is, no matter what the venue is, your job is to deliver. Um, and, you know, the, the more skills you have, the more frequently you will, as comedians say it, kill. You don't want to bomb, you want to kill. And, uh, you know, even the best comedians will still bomb. And the temptation is to always say, Oh, that was the crowd. They were they were a bad crowd. And that's a bad temptation to have because it's your job to read the crowd, understand the crowd and deliver them a show. Um, the most frustrating thing, though, is that I could deliver the same material two nights back to back and I could deliver it exactly the same. I could do it with the same exact intuition about the said crowd and have completely different results. And sometimes that roll of the dice is just, you know, it's just one of the realities of it. And that can be extremely frustrating. But the lowest low of bombing is totally, you know, it's worth living through that for the highest high of crushing a show. There's nothing better. Yeah. So, so you can't really predict the bomb. I mean, if all the things are in place one night to another, and it literally does come down to, okay, well, it's, it's just a different audience, then do you did you just write that off as, okay, that's the factor that I can't control. And I just got all things being equal or as equal as I could get them. I'm just going to say that's just the roll of the dice. Yeah. I, I mean, more often than not, there's something that you could have tweaked in hindsight to try and gain the audience. Typically, I mean, there, there are times where, as you said, all things being equal, where, you know, you look at it and you just can't crack what that difference was or where the connection, you know, sometimes it's just a vibe thing. The, mm -hmm. the crowd's just not feeling it. You're not in tune with your material, right? It's, it's so hard to gauge. But that's why a lot of comedians uh, make a habit of recording their set. Because oftentimes you'll finish a set and, you know, it just didn't connect. And then you listen to the tape and you listen to it again. 
and little things start to pop up where you go there was the mm-hmm. gap Interesting. that was the part where it didn't connect or maybe i i said something and the tone was off and that caused a disconnect you know there's all these little tiny tweaks and so whereas the hab is to be like oh that was a boring crowd they weren't into it and certainly that's a factor but as a comic your job is to read into that and then deliver nonetheless but sometimes it just doesn't add up i mean there's you know you can go see the most you know popular professional comedian in the world and if it's an off night it's an off night it's yeah. the same as a concert you can see the most killer mm-hmm. band and if they have a rough night you know it, it is what it is it's the nature of of live performance yeah i'm thinking as you're talking about that sort of the minute or the moment to moment of it thinking of playing this very delicate instrument where you know, a violin or something where it's like, I can imagine you going over the tape and be like, that's the moment or that's yep. the place where the note wasn't quite right. And and, and you how- can't always feel it in the moment. And a lot of times you can like trace that energy and you can kind of ride the energy of the crowd. I know that was typically with my style is I, I like to, you know, kind of respond with the crowd, but you don't always necessarily feel it when you're in the moment. And when you check that tape, then you, you have that, that separation, you have the distance from it where you go, there's that thing. That's the, and, you know, it's a macro thing, too, where you can have a bad slot on a show, you know, where, you know, because we always say the opener, their job is to take the bullets. Nobody likes hosting because the host has to go up and tell everybody to shut up. It's time for a comedy show. Get a couple laughs and kind of coax everything into action. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, you get up late in the night and the crowd is exhausted, they're laughed out. And even though you're doing killer material, they just don't have it. Or perhaps you've been put on stage at the time when everybody's starting to feel like they gotta use the bathroom. You know, it's like, there's so many different factors, both on the micro level of your set and the macro level of the show that can really just kind of twist. So your job is to just kind of be the best performer you can be and and hope that all the pieces are accounted for. Yeah. I think you could do it. I think oh, that you're no. very funny, Tina. Tina, oh, I've no. seen you do so many shows where you are in the centerpiece doing this big, goofy, absurd performance, and you are just commanding the crowd as this puppet master of insanity. And it's great, and it's hilarious. I totally think you could do it. Oh, well, you're very nice. I'd be the oldest living, like, stand-up. Don't you know, be so sure. I don't there, know. Uh, yeah, see, a... now you challenge me to think about it, though. I, you <laughs> should think you about it. It's very much one of those... It try it at least once and who yeah. knows because most comedians they try it and then they get hooked you know everyone goes oh how can you do that that must be awful and you go yeah it is but i can't not do it yeah you know, it i'm seems addicted like to such it such a tight wire such a but, but you know those are the things that we need to go towards so thank you Dan yeah, for that of for course that endorsement um, well, you know when you're doing a show and like you just have an on night and the crowd is just yeah. eating it up that feeling is I mean, it's there's nothing on the planet that feels better than that. Yeah. And stand up is that in its most pure, distilled essence is just, you know, you can get that. It's just if if you bomb, it's really awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels like much worse than if you're just having an off night and yeah, you're not yeah. quite as you're not delivering quite as much as you, you know, the, everything isn't firing the same way it did last night, mm. but you're still like passable, you know. But but yeah, that yeah. just feels like 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 a wicked witch puddle on the stage you know if like it doesn't happen but well because it's all you it's like if you crush the show it's like i did that that was me but if i bomb it's like that was me i screwed that up yeah. entirely so you know but it's worth it yeah yeah i could just gotta that. laugh it off move on to the next joke and if all else fails that's my time and the next comic comes up and yeah. go home and think and think like you it. said the analysis of it or sort of the replaying of it could be like super instrumental i think too and just you know understanding um let's let's just take a take a two step a, a sidestep over into film criticism now and the writing you're doing this had started before the pandemic came around right you've mm-hmm. been you've been writing for a while um for a long time for a long time better part of a decade now yeah so did you ever write like, did you ever go to a theater and like see movies and write criticism that way? Or has it always been, <laughs> this is really telling my age, but, or have you always been like reviewing in your home, you know, doing it that way? I mean, I've, I've always been a real, real big fan of movies and I've always been, I just always like to write. I think that, uh, I'm better at getting my thoughts out if I can get them on paper first, because I, I tend to 
speak faster than I think. And I've often gotten myself in trouble saying things that I shouldn't have said because I'm just going. So the the writing aspect allows me to really uh, like curate my thoughts in a way that, that uh, works. And I've always loved talking about movies, much to the dismay of most people I know, because they're like, do you think about anything but movies? And the answer is rarely. And so I've always just loved watching movies and talking about them. So putting pen to paper was just kind of the next logical step with that. And as opportunities started to present themselves, you know, as a freelancer or, you know, amidst things like Movie John, and uh, which actually Cinema 76 is now part of Movie John, we've merged, um, you know, opportunities to just be part of that community. It just kind of naturally happened. I, I just love, I, I love movies and I love writing. So it, it's just kind of the perfect mix. So what is your perfect viewing setup? Like what's the perfect environment for you to watch a film? I love going to the theater. I mean, I, I can't wait to return to that. Um, going to the theater, I think is ideal because you have the optimized picture, you have the optimized sound. Um, for the most part, I think that movies should be a collective experience. There's something better about watching in a room full of people that are all engaged with the same material as opposed to watching at home. That said, in the pandemic, I spent a pretty serious chunk of change updating my home theater for fear of not getting back to the movie theater anytime soon. So I've managed to optimize at home, but the one thing that you can't do at home yet is watch with a large group of people. But I think the theater is the way to go. I think that most filmmakers, when they shoot their movies, shoot it with an eye to it being presented, exhibited in the theatrical setting. Um, so it really is the ideal way to do it. How, how did you optimize your home theater? I bought a giant TV, I bought a big, uh, uh, Jenna, my better half, gifted me a sound bar for Christmas, which gives you the booming sound. And I got a 4K DVD player, or Blu-ray player, and I started collecting a bunch of my favorite movies in the highest quality imaginable. And uh, yeah, that's that's really been it. Because mostly, I before I did that, I was watching everything at the theater. As a critic, you have that yeah. privilege. But everything else, I would be watching right here on my iPad, which yeah. is quite nice. But, um, you know, it, it's it's not not the same. But you do what you do in a pandemic. So what do you think that is about about that experience of of a lot of people being in the theater at the same time, which can be, I guess, sometimes can be annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Put your phones away if you're at the theater, people. Yeah. Put your phones away. <laughs> and sometimes, and the some and the and the sometimes can be good. Is the better part? Is it the co? Is it? What do you think that is? I mean, I think it's just kind of a, a group energy. It's the same thing that in a, like a stand-up comedy show that, you know, if you can get a pocket of people laughing, that tends to spread. And I mm -hmm. think that happens in a movie too. So you have these big emotional swells and the movie, you know, you're responding to it, but you look around and everybody's responding to it. And so that makes everything exponentially better. You see a comedy, you know, a big laugh happens, you laugh and that starts to spread. Or my favorite is at a horror movie and something scary happens, you jump out of your seat and then you look around and realize everybody else jumped out of their seat too. And then everybody kind of shares a giggle and re-engages with the film. It, it's just, it turns it into a great communal experience. And I, I think it's just that kind of shared subconscious energy that we all have. Uh, I, I don't think there's really a way to put a finger on it, but uh, you know, it's just, it's, it just makes it better. It's it, laughing alone stinks, but laughing with others is the greatest thing in the world. So it's really just a, yeah, I would just say it's that shared energy. So when you're getting ready to review a film at home, or, well, this is a two-part question, but when you're getting ready to review a film at home, do you have like a time when you sit down every day to to watch films? Do you watch more than one at a sitting? How do you, how do you move through? Like you have to write a review for a film, you know, are you seeing multiple in a day? And how Sometimes. does that experience work for you? How soon are you writing after you watch? Kind of depends on the movie. Um, some movies I come out of and I'm just popping. I'm so hot. I'm like, oh man, I got to write about this right away while I'm fresh. And I typically, uh, I don't always take notes. It depends on the movie. Sometimes I really like to let it wash over me. Sometimes, like I, I usually like to have a notepad just so I can write character names or, you know, settings and things like that so that I can properly reference them in the review. Because, you know, nothing sounds less professional than when you're writing about a character and it's very clear that you don't remember their name. 
Um, you know, so you gotta, I take notes for things like that. But for the most part, you know, I, I like to review pretty close to uh, to when, when I finished watching the movie. When you go to like a critic screening uh, at a theater, you know, that's sometimes you let out at like 10 at night and I got to go to bed. So, you know, it might be a day or two before I sit down and, you know, start plunking away at it. But uh, especially in, in pandemic, oftentimes distributors will send it in the form of like a screener link that you watch on your computer um, or you can log into an app on your television. And so in a situation like that, you know, if I end up watching the movie early in the day, there's a very real chance that just the energy coming off of that movie inspires me to sit down and start writing. But the real writing happens, I think, as, as you would know, it happens in the edit. Um, I tend to just do, you know, a word vomit where I come out and I just start, I like this, I didn't like this, blah, 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 blah. And then later I can go back and with the magic of word processing can kind of rearrange everything and turn it into a more coherent, readable piece. Um, it's -hmm. typically pretty tight to when I watch the movie though, because I have a personal rule where I don't, I won't write about a movie, uh, I won't read about a movie until after I've written it. I don't like to be influenced by another critic's thoughts. So I tend to, I, I like to read other critics. So I tend to write my piece pretty quick so that I have more time to go and read other pieces before I get you know bored of thinking about it. How do you feel like the, your writing or the way that you, the, the way that you come to film is different than other critics who you read? Um, I mean, I, I think that, I don't want to harsh too much on the, on the critical world, but I think that there's sometimes a, a, a kind of crappy mentality of showing up with your arms folded and basically saying to the movie, like, okay, impress me. And I, I think that's the wrong way to watch a movie. I think that it should be arms open and you embrace the movie, you view it on its own terms. Uh, so often I will see a review where someone will review a movie be, uh, negatively because it's not the movie they want it to be. And that's not fair because I think you should review it based on what the movie wants to be and if it is successful at being that. But for the most part, I prefer to write from from experience, like my experience watching the movie. And it's similar to the filter that we act as being a comedian. You know, if you look at like an observational comic, it's not the observations that we're laughing at. It's the perspective of the comedian they take that observation and filter it through whatever their style is and then put it back out there. And in, in the world of, of film, you know, like there's a movie that I, I could watch and just, it does not work for me at all, but it's also somebody else's favorite movie. So to bring objectivity into it and say, this movie is factually bad, I think is just kind of pointless and defeats the purpose. But to say, here was my experience with it. Here's why it didn't work for me is the way to go, or here's why it did work for me. Here's why I really loved it, or I was middling about it, or, you know, wherever you land on it. I, I, I don't really like to read critics that treat it as like a clinician, where they go into it and look at the, the technique of the film and things like that. I have certain critics that I like to read because it's their perspective that I appreciate. And so that's what I like to approach is, I'm not here to tell you what the movie is or isn't. I'm here to tell you what my experience is with it. And if you're a regular reader and you understand my perspective about movies, hopefully that's enjoyable to you and you know points you in the direction of whether or not you want to watch it. But at the end of the day, I want you to watch everything I see. Because even if you tend to agree with me 99% of the time, if you can find something in a movie that I didn't, then that's, I mean, that's the coolest. Yeah. What's the, what is the Dan Scully filter like look like do you think who <laughs> that's a tough question um well he's got a short beard he's got some glasses uh i mean no, i i tend to look at things with a bit of a sense of humor i tend to look at things in terms of just entertainment value in the moment and then sort of after the fact i will go into why i suspect maybe certain lenses were used or you know just certain editing techniques and how they evoked certain emotions for me but yeah, I would say that my lens is one of, I went into this wanting to enjoy it and really hoping to enjoy it. And, you know, I want to, I want to dance with that tiger. So if someone else comes to a movie with that positive angle of, you know, I hope I'm entertained by this as opposed to, you know, dance for me, monkey, entertain me. I, that's, that's my thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, I was really fascinated with a review that you wrote recently of, um, of Honeydew. Honeydew. Oh man, I really had a 
blast with that movie. Well, well, I had a blast reading your review of it. Thank you. Um, and it made me want to see it. And and a couple of the things I wanted to ask you about, um, and I guess we have to just be careful of, you know, um, well, well, yeah. I mean, I don't want to give it away, but 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 some things that really um you said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but so it's a rural horror horror flick, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which I want to talk about what that is because I just okay. go to In Cold Blood, but that you know I don't know what a rural horror flick is, so I want you to describe that. So describe that, and then I'll go to my second part. I mean, I mean, in the review, I did mention Texas Chainsaw Massacre a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I think of when I think of rural horror. Um, I think the the more dismissive way to call it would be like backwoods horror, or you know, referring to. The whole idea is that it is uh, typically our protagonists are folks that find themselves in a foreign land and that foreign land being that of, you know, for lack of a better term, the redneck. Uh, Now, that's not always the case with rural horror, but there's a certain foreignness to, uh, you know, especially coming from an urban environment, there's a certain foreignness to the location of something like Honeydew or something like Texas Chainsaw, where you go, oh, are, are we seeing someone here? who is just from another world or is there something uh, malevolent going on? And it's tough to tell just because of that, that uh, the distance between, you know, uh, between what we know and what they know. Mm -hmm. And so it, it adds this incredible layer of horror where you're going, I'm trying to be polite here, but I'm also trying to act in self-preservation. I don't want to other these people, but I also need to make sure that there's nothing strange afoot. And it's tough to tell because of that culture clash. And when the specific culture clash is urban versus rural, that's where, where, how I cate- excuse mm-hmm. me, categorize rural horror. Mm-hmm. You wrote that you came out of, you said, I'm paraphrasing, at the end of the film, you were not okay. Yes. How so? <laughs> so, um, as somebody who really loves horror, I mean, you'll see behind me, I have a gruesome, horrifying horror poster on my wall. Um, one of the things that I look for in horror, um, and once again, I'll tie it to comedy, in that comedy and horror are always kind of joined at the hip. The reason I suspect is that they're the only two genres of film that require an involuntary response in order to be considered successful. You don't have to be crying your eyes out at the end of a drama movie for the drama to be considered successful. But a laugh is involuntary. Feeling scared is involuntary. And horror and comedy are always connected because, you know, comedy is you take someone down a path and then you subvert that path and then they laugh as sort of a a coping mechanism for the discomfort. Horror is not so different. And fear is not so different. It's why we often see horror movies that have a dark streak of humor And oftentimes we'll see a comedy movie that has truly horrifying things happen in it. And so when I say that I'm not okay at the end, I I mean that as a compliment because this movie caused a visceral upset. There's some Mm -hmm. gruesome stuff in it. There's some very intense stuff in it. And I was made very uncomfortable. And, you know, if you're a fan of horror movies, you're sort of chasing that discomfort. And so many horror movies fail to provide that. And Honeydew did not. It it provided it in droves. And so it ended and I just was looking at my screen thinking, man, I, I my, my stomach hurts. I'm sweating. This is great that they were able to make my body do this without me even realizing. So that's sort of what I meant by not okay. It sounded as though, and what I really appreciated about the review as well, was that you talked about the way in which they built the suspense um, mm-hmm. in a sort of sounded like an uh, an unusual way or a, a way that doesn't happen a lot um i hope i'm getting that right but yeah. but that's what interested me about it was that it seemed like you appreciated in that film this sort of different tactic to get you know to get to that place mm-hmm. At least i mean it was a slow burn the film. yeah the front yeah. end is very much a slow burn and the problem with the slow burn is that you're walking a thin line you have to validate it at some point because if it's a slow burn and it stays a slow burn, then it's boring. And so this was a movie where I would imagine someone who was, I could imagine somebody not keying into it. You know, I I don't think it's for everybody, but uh, you know, I, I was hoping, and and I think this, this speaks to like my lens as I went in, I think a lot of people go, man, nothing's happening. I got to check out, but I invested and thought this is going somewhere. 
And I'm hopeful that this is really going to pay off this buildup. And, and it so much more than paid off that buildup. But it was kind of uh, the, the way that it built up was sort of atypical in that it took its time. It dips in and out of dream logic. A couple illogical things happen that after the fact, you can understand once you have the full information. But it's never cryptic. It's just, it's just a slow burn. It, it only gives you the information you need when you need it. And then after the fact, when you have the information, all these little idiosyncrasies fall into place and make sense. And so it's the type of movie that I'm excited to watch again because of that. And a lot of movies that have a slow burn don't necessarily earn that rewatch. And Honeydew certainly did. But is there, it sounded like from your review, as though there's just a ton of information being transmitted in the slow burn. Yes. The look. A ton of information that you don't even understand is information yet. Right. But like it always seems me? like stylish. I'm sorry. No, I'm, go I'm ahead. No, go, no, go ahead. No, <laughs> go ahead. These, um, no, go there's ahead. There's all these like stylish quirks that you go, oh, is that just a quirk to make me feel uncomfortable? Or is there information there? And then another information drop later will redefine what you just saw a few moments before and go, okay, they were telling me something with that. And so it is atypical in that way that you don't even know you're being fed information until it's way too late for you to to have a reaction to it in the moment. And that makes it that much scarier. In my review, mm -hmm. I referred to it as being like that feeling when you just realized you were almost hit by a car and had mm -hmm. you been an inch to the right, you would have been smashed but it's too late to have done anything about it. It consistently delivered that feeling with its information delivery system. This is a total question at a left field and I'm, yeah. but, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, so do you feel like Hitchcock used any of that slow burn that you're talking about? Oh, definitely. Um, and I, admittedly, there's a lot of Hitchcock I have not seen. Um, there's plenty that I have, but um, like I, I recently watched uh, Rope mm -hmm. and Rope is absolutely fantastic. And what's cool about Rope is that we go into it knowing what happened. We go into it knowing that there is a body in the box and these two guys are basically gloating that they managed to pull this off. And um, I mean, the, the plot of Rope is these two guys kill somebody just to see if they can get away with it. And then the whole movie is, I think, a single, I mean, it's a single take. Mm -hmm. And it's a dinner party where the dinner is actually served on the box where mm -hmm. this body is hidden. And so it ends up being this sort of a slow burn of will they get caught won't they get caught what is their end game to doing this is it just ego or is there are they leading up to something so that's a that's an instance where absolutely hitchcock is doing something where someone might make a statement um i think it, is it jimmy stewart in that you know we'll make a statement and you go does he know more than than the I movie's know. letting us letting us on that he knows and so then after the fact, we find out whether or not he does. So yeah, it's very Hitchcockian. I mean, even uh, something as, as classic as, you know, and almost done to death as Psycho is, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a movie where the reveal, uh, you know, spoiler alert for a decades old movie, but, you know, the reveal that Mother and, and Norman are one and the same is something that actually ends up informing repeat viewings because you can watch it again going, oh, wow, that thing that Norman said is actually he's he's almost directly admitting to the fact that he's mother but you know and having to figure out to what degree even he's aware of of his own uh you know faculties mm -hmm. going going haywire um yeah i would say that's absolutely hitchcockian uh with honeydew though i think it's more of like a west craven movie because it's mm -hmm. trying to affront your senses a little bit mm -hmm. and uh then then fill in the information after the fact but um yeah i mean hitchcock's the master for a reason he knows how to do it. So on, on that sort of spoiler thread, I'm totally fascinated with your podcast too. Um, uh, I like you. the movie, movie. So, and, and, and why, why it became, I mean, for numerous reasons, it was interesting, but one thing that kept cropping up for me as I was listening is, so how do you do this without spoiling it all for everybody? How do you negotiate those twists and turns? I guess you just get good at it after you've been doing it for a while as to how to talk about it without giving it away we typically with i like to movie movie we don't even really consider that too much because regular listeners know that we are going to get into spoiler territory mm -hmm. so the way that we format it is usually when we open the show um you know we'll do our housekeeping and all that and the first like 10 or 20 minutes we try not to spoil we just talk about our response to the movie talk about you know who made it who wrote it 
you know, what else they've written, things like that. That way, if somebody is tuned into the show, they're not immediately being told, like, turn this off, go watch the movie. I mean, mm-hmm. that's just bad podcasting to say, please right. turn us off and go do something else. It's just a terrible idea. And so it's great to kind of hit the information, sell the audience on the movie, you know, just in case they haven't listened to it yet. And then afterwards, there's the in-depth discussion where we have to spoil because we're getting into whatever thematic resonance it has, um, you know, whatever character motivations, then you kind of essentially need to spoil. So I think dividing it uh, to make it a little bit for everybody and not telling people who haven't seen the movie to, to turn us off, you know, too early is, is just a smart move to gaining listeners. But also, too, we tend to pick movies that even after they're spoiled uh, are still enjoyable. So in case somebody just comes into it and doesn't want to watch the movie, um, I, I, I'd like to think we still offer something for that listener as well, um, giving them a movie, you know, a discussion of a movie, sort of, you know, the, the fun of digging into any movie is, is fun to listen to, I'd hope. So, uh, so yeah, we just, we try to avoid it until a little bit later into the podcast, but um, in the title, this sort of happened accidentally. Um, I like to movie movie was just a parody of that song. I like to move it, move it. <laughs> and so me and my co-host Garrett Smith, who uh, is also a fellow stand-up comedian, that's how we sort of came together. Um, you know, we were just being goofy with that title. But as our show developed, we came up with this concept of a movie movie. And a movie movie is a movie that uses all of the tools available to the medium in order to tell their story. You know, when film started, a lot of it was just, we're pointing a camera at a play, do the play and we film it. And then things start to happen where people start to realize editing can tell the story. Oh, throw a score on there. That can tell the story, get some special effects in here, do that. You know, and so there's all these pieces that come together. And so when a movie is categorized as a movie movie, spoiling almost becomes not a concern because the plot machinations are kind of minimal to what is enjoyable about a movie movie. Um, What ends up being enjoyable is story, character, and the film technique. And so it's like, yeah, if you know the twist or the reveal or whatever, that's fine. But, you know, if a movie hinges upon a single reveal, then what's with the other two hours of the movie? You know, so it's got to, you know, you you want something that's the complete package. And we really do try to focus on selecting movie movies as our focal point. So spoilers, you know, kind of become irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. You know, like you watch like Romeo and Juliet, everybody knows what happens, but you go see that show to see what this company's take Mm -hmm. on Romeo and Juliet is. And so if a movie's done right, you know, that, that the plot is, you know, comes third place to everything else. Yeah. So how do you become a tomato meter approved critic? <laughs> you apply and then you wait. <laughs> That's the, so uh... do you have to like, this is on Rotten Tomatoes. Do you have to, do you have to like submit? <laughs> yeah. When do you yeah, get you to be a good just tomato? Like a reel. Okay. <laughs> to be, to be... <laughs> yes, I'm a good tomato. <laughs> I mean, you just have um, to. It's just like any other process. You're applying like for a job, and you just have to. Yeah. Okay. You send them your portfolio. I mean, it, it was the kind of thing. I I didn't apply until I was about five years into you know writing movies, and I had hundreds upon hundreds of reviews. So you know, I I went in. I said, here's the sites that I write for. This is their hit count. Here's, you know, a couple of my favorite pieces that I think represent, uh, you know, me as a writer. And here's links to every review I've ever done. Just boom, check it out. Because essentially they're looking for thoughtful criticism, but mostly they're looking for people that are serious about it. Um, Because you get a lot of people who go, I have a blog and all that. And that's not not a critic. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think people who log into Rotten Tomatoes, you know, they're looking for people who who do consider themselves, to, excuse me, to be actual critics. You know, there there is a, uh, you know, there's like a level of quality that they want to maintain, not just, you know, hey, I liked it. Boo, I didn't like it, you know. Um, and, and so, and to Rotten Tomatoes credit, in order to diversify their critic pool, they opened up and said, listen, we need, you know, we need voices of color. We need women. We need, you know, older folks, younger folks. We need everything. And so they kind of opened up and that was about the time that uh, I got approved. And it was about two years after I submitted, I had totally forgotten that I did it. And then one day I got an email that was just like, Hey, you know, you're in. And so, um, 
I, I think their efforts to try and be representative of a large diverse audience uh, caused them to to really uh, just be thoughtful about about who they let in. And so, yeah, it's really just an apply and and wait kind of thing. And luckily they said yes. And so me and a couple of the other writers on the site, and, and this is actually really cool too. If enough writers for a certain outlet are approved, it blanket approves the outlet. Oh. And so, you know, when reviews go up on Movie John, even if the author is not yet approved uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, and I'm sure everybody eventually will be, um, the outlet can still go up there. And so it's mutually beneficial. It draws clicks to the outlet and the outlet draws eyes to Rotten Tomatoes. And the more reviews that are under the sun, the more accurate that percentage rating can be. Realizing that you are a person that goes into movies wanting to love the film, which is which is just great, right? For for it's the right it, way, it's the yeah, and it also yeah, it puts you in the right position to be open. What was an experience you had recently or ten years ago where you thought I am just not going to make it through this film, knowing that you had to? Ooh, that's tough. Is I, that hard? All right. It is hard, but I, I think that, um, I mean, there's and, a couple and, and movies more, that, that come more... to mind. Sorry, yeah. Well, no, it's. A, I think what happens to me is that I, I'm always going to finish a movie. I'm a firm believer that, like, you can't really offer a review if you leave before it's over. You can say, oh, it wasn't working for me, but I left. But you don't really have the information to do much more than that. Uh, so I tend to stick it out to the bitter end. <laughs> no matter what movie I'm watching, I will stick it out to the bitter end. But um, I think what usually disengages me is if uh, I don't like when movies uh, forget to have a story because they like came up with a message first and then built a story around it. I like when the message comes through uh, the movie, um, and and I, or sometimes if a movie's just so cryptic, like I love Terrence Malick. I think Terrence Malick is an incredible filmmaker, but he made a movie called Night of Cups that 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 review kind of was was one of the more popular ones on Cinema seventy six because it was very clear that I had checked out midway through the movie. It was so artsy fartsy, for lack of better term, and so cryptic, and it was just a pastiche of images and stuff that I, I just couldn't engage with it. I felt like it was pushing me away at all times. And so that's an example where I, you know, I, I opened up my arms and said, let me embrace this movie. And to me, it felt like the movie went, stay away from me. And so that's what will, will typically disengage me from a movie, but I will always finish it. That's just yeah. who I am. I'm always going to take a break. It. Or do you do you really? Try I mean, that to one I couldn't because it was in the theater. So I just um, had to had to stick it out. Uh, sometimes I'll take a break because there's been plenty of times in my life where I've watched a movie and been like, oh, that didn't work for me. And then a year later, I watch it and go, man, I was tripping. I that this was great, you know. And it's just you bring a lot of baggage to it without realizing it. And so oftentimes, you know, I I, I will write a negative review of a movie and be like, I think I just wrote a review of my bad day, and I gave the movie an unfair shake, you know. And so. The, you oh, always have to be open to that fluidity. You know, it's just you, you go in and you go, ah, oh, that reads wrong. And then I realized perhaps I was reading it wrong. Um, I had a film that I saw at uh, the Philadelphia Film Festival a few years back called Under the Tree. And I had watched maybe 50 movies over the course of a week because I was covering the film festival. And this was towards the end. And it, maybe 10 minutes into the movie, I, I had my hand on my head and I'm going, man, this is just not working. And then a couple of years later, uh, the movie gained a wide release and I had an opportunity to review it a second time. And it was incredible. I loved it. And I thought, wow, that's amazing that my exhaustion of having watched so many darn movies in a week gave, you know, gave me this, this feeling of negativity towards a film that when I watched it later was just a fantastic movie. And so I'm always open wow. to the idea that it's, uh, you know, it's not you, it's me to the movie. But um, that's yeah, so typically a movie though. that doesn't want to engage with me is what I disengage with. But there are times like that where it's just I had a bad day and wouldn't you know it, I, I, I brought it with me unfairly. That's interesting, though, because you you know, because you are looking at it from so many different angles. You know, you're, you're trying to come at it from a thoughtful perspective with a lot of different um, ways to come into the movie. And also, I think interesting that you know your, that about yourself, that on one hand, you could see a film that you just utterly 
you know, we're just really having a problem with. And then you were like, wow, this is great. Yeah, it and just happens. Pretty, do you give time in between, like when you see the film, particularly on ones where you're not as excited about something, do you have like a buffer in there where you let it sit for a little bit before you send the review? Or is it more like you don't realize it until you come back two years later? I mean, have, have the instances Sometimes. where you've changed your mind been longer spans or... I, typically longer spans when I've changed my mind, but I often find like most movies that I like, I come out of real hot. That was amazing. And then it kind of fizzles and I'm more fair to how the movie was. And if a movie comes out that I didn't like, I'll come out of it just like, man, that was garbage. But, and then it kind of softens. But like I said before, that tends to come through in the edit. You know, if I, if I hated a movie, I'll come out and I'll bang out some vitriol as hard as I can with full well knowing that I'm not going to submit it to my editor for three or four days and I'm going to do a couple passes on it as that cools down and then I can kind of look and be like you know what I'm actually being unfair with that statement or okay that's spot on I still feel that way and so you know it's always good to have a cooling off period that said I have uh, plenty of readers that have told me that they enjoy reading my negative re reviews more because they're funnier. So like sometimes <laughs> if I don't like a movie, I find that without even realizing it, I will lean into the humor of how bad I thought the movie was just because it's enjoyable for me to write that as a humorist as opposed to as a critic. But, you know, I, I do like to have that cooling off period where I can edit and do a couple passes so that I'm not like, wow, I'm just being unfair to this poor filmmaker. I'm being off base here. You know, I don't, I don't ever want to be in that position. Yeah. Do you, of the filmmaker, the, of the critics that you most read their work and feel most um, drawn to their criticism, do you feel you tend to agree more often with them? Um, I wouldn't say I necessarily agree more often with like their overall impression on a movie, but I'll agree with their approach to how they watched a movie. You know, I, I will read, you know, a review of a movie that I liked that one of my favorite reviewers will be negative. But the reason I read the reviews is because they'll be able to accurately explain to me how they came to that conclusion. And um, I think that that's really the way to go about it, because you know, it, it, it's such a weird art, because most people nowadays aren't going, oh, I wonder if I should see this. Let me read a critic. It's typically, I saw it and I don't know how to feel about it. Let me read a critic. You know, there's, there's very little by way of people deciding whether or not they actually want to see a movie based on a review, at least in my experience. And it's more trying to essentially having a, a conversation after the fact about it. And so like, like my, uh, my, the other host of I Like to Movie Movie, we agree on a movie as often as we don't. But I always find that our methodology towards getting to what we feel about the movie is very similar. Um, Garrett also tends to approach things with an idea of, I want to like this movie, I'm going to dance with it on its own terms, and then whether or not I can jive with that is, you know, remains to be seen. So I think that when I read a reviewer, what I'm looking for is thoughtful criticism, as opposed to someone coming at it saying this is factually good or factually bad. I want the thought of... I felt this way and here's why here's where I think it could have been tweaked to be better. Here's where I think there was a mistake. Here's where they nailed it. You know, that that's sort of what I'm looking for. So the people that I read tend to, uh, to serve that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever turn in a movie theater and ask someone to be quiet? Oh, all the time. Do you, what does that all look the like? Time. And how long do you give it? Um, because it depends like I, I understand like I go to a lot of horror movies and I understand that part of that is reactivity reaction is good interaction is bad <laughs> and so if somebody's <laughs> reacting and oh and they have a oh you know mm -hmm. kind of thing that's fine or if you're laughing or whatever but when somebody starts to converse with the movie <laughs> that becomes a problem because first off the movie can't hear you <laughs> and second off everybody here wants to see the movie they didn't come to, like if you if you want to yell at your TV, stay home and go crazy. I yell at my TV all the time at home. But in the theater, I think there's a certain level of tact. So typically what that looks like is <laughs> I will put on my dad voice. And I'm not a dad, but I am in my late 30s. And so you tend to get a dad voice around 32 where you can just do a, please be quiet. And that <laughs> typically works. Um, but we live in Philadelphia. So sometimes that opens up a new... Uh, you know a whole new can of worms where people will push back mm -hmm. i find more often than not 
the crowd is supportive of the person asking someone to be quiet more so than they are supportive of the interrupter. Mm -hmm. Um, But to tell you the truth, it's not that much of a problem. I really have not run into a lot of talkers. I am much more agitated with the people who sit there and text because that little glowing light fills the dark room and it just kind of ruins things. And it's like, if you can't have your phone away from you for 90 minutes, then maybe you should have just stayed home. But for the most part, I think most people are are receptive to being, you know, they, when people go, shut up, ah, you know, like then it causes a problem. But if you politely just say, hey, please be quiet, or can you please stop talking? That tends to work. And I've certainly, you know, uh, whispered a comment to one of my friends that I'm seeing a movie with and someone will say, hey, please stop talking. And if that happens, I will shut my mouth because mm-hmm. I don't want to be that guy. So yeah, I, I think that there's room for for conversation. There's room for reactivity. It's just the interactivity when they're, you know, <laughs> asking characters on screen a question where it's like, it's just not how this works. So does the phone light thing bother you enough to be able to say, could you put that away? Or is that just something you can't really comment on? Or have you done that? I've done that. I, I, I think that it's fair to ask somebody to put their phone away. Um, you know, it, it it's... It sucks because I think it's it's a muscle memory. People grab their phone as soon as they're not engaged. And it's a shame because there are periods in a movie where you're supposed to kind of ride that engagement wave. Yeah. That's just part of the, the tonal experience. And so I think just the way our culture is, you're very much, you know, inclined to do that. It's just, it's hard to enforce, you know, it, it makes me mad because there's a sign out front that says, put your phone away. There's a projection on the screen that says, put your phone away. Before the movie starts, there's a commercial reminding you to put your phone away. It, uh, especially at the Ritz in Philadelphia, somebody comes in, an usher, and reminds everybody to put their phone away. So it's like, don't act like you didn't get the memo. Mm-hmm. And so I think what bugs me about it is that it's very prominent evidence that this person doesn't care. And that upsets me because tickets are, are not cheap. And if you're going to pay $20 for a ticket, I'm paying for that experience. And I want that experience. And if my experience is not valuable to you, who also paid $20 and is spending the time on their phone, then what are we even doing here? And that glowing light in a dark room can really rattle you out of the experience. I want to be hypnotized by the movie. And when little phones start popping up everywhere, it's tough to have that sense of engagement, which is what everybody ostensibly in the room is paying for. And there's a little darkened hallway in the back of every theater that you can stand up, go back and text to your heart's delight. Um, But when you do it in the seat, it's just, I, I find that disrespectful and have asked people to put their phone away before and more so than talking, people are receptive. They'll be like, oh, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. put it away. I, I think generally people are better than, than, than we like to give them credit for. Um, you know, it is what it is. But what's cool about a lot of the, the press screenings is that because phones are a piracy concern, a lot of press screenings have agents at the front that actually collect phones, mm-hmm. put them in a bag and give you a ticket to retrieve after the movie's over. And... Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that that's not a solution that could happen to a mass market movie theater, but I love when a press screening takes away phones because that nips the problem right in the bud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And honestly, and I, I, it's, if I'm watching a movie and my phone's buzzing in my pocket, that's a distraction too. So like, I, I tend to turn mine off entirely. Uh, And so I, I, even for me, I just love not having my phone on me because it forces me to really tune in and be there for the reason I'm there. Mm-hmm. so you're jumping into i'm gonna jump uh take a two steps to the left now jumping into the directing uh the Ooh, directing baby. thing with your first um horror anthology and, yes um w- when did you realize that was the next step or an well, additional step I've always wanted to make a movie. I've always wanted to be able to point at the screen and be like, that came out of my brain. It's like an ego thing. I've always wanted to do it. And I write scripts so often that there's no reason why I shouldn't get a camera pointed at one of them and throw some actors into it. And I have a friend who is a filmmaker and he is in the process of making a full length movie that will be wide released and will be out in the theaters. And he came to me and he said, you're real big on, on, you know, horror. And I said, oh yeah, I love it. 
And he said, do you like anthologies? I said, yeah, they're probably my favorite type of horror because, you know, an anthology is essentially a collection of short films tied together by a wraparound story. And uh, he's pitched this idea that we were working on of, of a, a horror anthology that takes place in a house. And so the wraparound story would just be a guy, you know, touring a house, but each room that he visits cuts to a short film that takes place in that room. And so I said to my buddy, I was like, I think I can write a bathroom story. Can I take a stab at it? And he was like, sure, go for it. And so I did, I sat down, I cranked it out. And just from discussing that, we started having meetings and it turned into a thing where we said, you know what, we can get some money for this. We can make this happen. We can showcase local filmmakers. And we were talking before, uh, before we started recording how an anthology film is a killer way to have a diverse body of filmmakers showing off individual work. And horror can be so many different things. I mean, it can be supernatural. It can be a slasher. It can be, you know, a psychological thriller. It can really be anything. And so we decided this is a great opportunity to highlight some Philadelphia filmmakers, to be able to shoot something really cheap and kind of give everybody who's involved creative free reign to just get a crew together, throw something together, and then we'll assemble it into a movie. And uh, as we discussed this, <laughs> my friend said, hey, you could probably direct yours. And as soon as you said that, I was, I, I, the ego kicked in. I said, yeah, you know what? I probably could. And so I'm going to. Um, I think I will be co-directing with somebody, uh, someone who has more experience with the uh, technical craft of it. But in terms of, of making a movie, I've always wanted to, and, and now's the time. So Philadelphia, keep your eyes open. We're hoping to shoot this fall and hoping to have this thing distributed sometime in the next year or two. Are you using the, is your entry the bathroom script? Yes, it is a bathroom script. It is a horrifying and terrifically violent and bloody scene that I've written. And I cannot wait to, to make it visual and share it with the world. And I'm going to have to hire a good mop guy because it's going to take a lot of blood. And will all of these episodes, are they theoretically just in the same house or are they literally going to be in the same house? Literally in the same house, but they will all take place at different times and places. Um, it's, I mean, really, the, that's the only rule that we have for our crew of filmmakers is your entry has to take place in one room and no one can leave the room. It's just that room. And then, um, you know, and then we will have a wraparound story uh, involving each room that, it, that kind of encompasses the whole house so that as each room is visited, we can flash to that and come back to it. Um, I don't want to get too deep into mm -hmm. the details, but um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you look at any, any, I'm trying to think of a good anthology horror film to reference. Um, you know, like there's a, a great one called Cat's Eye and Cat's Eye is based on a bunch of Stephen King short stories. And the wraparound is that there's a single cat that just kind of weaves in and out of each story. So we just follow the cat. He enters the story the story happens and then the cat moves into the next one. And so I love that format for an anthology. And so we're essentially doing that and using the house as the larger setting, the rooms as the micro settings. This one's kind of a, definitely out of left field, but what do you think about Stephen King as a filmmaker generally? Do you tend to? Um, I mean, it's a mixed bag. He is undoubtedly my favorite writer. Um, I think that the scripts that he tends to write for other filmmakers are usually pretty fantastic because, you know, who's going to get his material more than him? The results are a mixed bag. I think with Stephen King, oftentimes it'll be a short story expanded to feature length and therefore there's filler. Or it'll be one of his giant behemoth weighty tomes that has to get brought down to two mm -hmm. hours and therefore a lot of details get lost. And so if you have a good filmmaker, all of that's possible. And just by the sheer prolific nature, I mean, there are so many movies that have come out of Stephen King's work. I mean, he writes books faster than I can read him. I don't want him to die, but when he does, I'm gonna be like, finally, I can catch up because he is outpacing me like crazy. I can't do it. Um, so yeah, some, some of his, his stories translate to film well, some don't. Um, we've been seeing remakes that, that of ones that have already been translated. I think that, that uh, we sort of reached a golden age now of people truly understanding his work and being able to make movies out of it. Uh, recently, Dr. Sleep, which was his sequel to The Shining, was made into a movie. 
And famously, Stephen King was not a fan of uh, Kubrick's adaptation of The Shining. Uh, he's, he's come around on it in later years. Uh, it's very different than the book. So his sequel book, Dr. Sleep, is a sequel to the book and not the movie. But the adaptation of that book sequel, you know, ad adapts the book and sequelizes The Shining. It serves so many masters and does so perfectly. And I suspect it's because we've now been so bathed in the work of Stephen King that we sort of understand his themes better. But more often than not, I think the movies based on his work are great because if you have good writing, you know, everything else, I don't want to say you can phone it in, but like the worst director can take a piece of good writing and it's still going to be a good piece of mm -hmm. writing. And, you know, more often than not, we're Stephen King's writing is going to be on point. I'm a huge fan, <laughs> huge fan. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, I'm going to get one more in here. Just we've got a, just a couple of minutes. We're kind of over, but um, I don't over for what? I don't know. I got He's nowhere like, to be. You can stay here all night. Um, yeah. Do you have a, this is a lame question, but I was, I like, I like what comes out of it. And that is, do you have a filmmaker for whom every time they they put a film out you're just over the moon oh yeah easily my favorite movie ever is, is boogie nights oh. uh paul thomas anderson i think is w one of the best filmmakers ever he's certainly my favorite filmmaker working today i don't i don't think there's a single movie of his that isn't near perfect if not perfect um everything i see him do and, and he has such a wide variety of work something like magnolia is so different than something like inherent vice which is a pinchon ad adaptation um punch drunk love is wildly different than hard eight um he was phantom he's just thread, a great right? mix Wasn't of he? craft he was phantom thread and phantom thread is is i mean that movie's unbelievable mm -hmm. it's this stark period drama that's also probably the funniest movie of the last decade i i don't know how how he does it and he's just consistently putting out high quality, classy work that is pretty accessible, I think, overall. And no two are the same. And, and also, I mean, I, I'm a big Joaquin Phoenix fan. So I like that he sort of entered a Joaquin Phoenix period for a little mm -hmm. bit there. Um, and same with, uh, uh, now I'm going to forget his name, with um, Daniel Day-Lewis. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Paul Thomas Anderson is the guy that even, even a lesser movie of his, I'm going to find something to just love about it. Um, yeah, Phantom Thread, I can just watch again and again and again because the detail is so, mm -hmm. is so, I mean, you talked a little bit about the use of food in, in, uh, in Honeydew, like the, yes. the food, how it, and I, I was interested in how that, how food, the use of food in that film was different than, say, in Phantom Thread. Oh, certainly. Um, like in Phantom Thread, the food, as it's depicted, looks lavish and lush. It speaks to the uh, wealth and privilege that uh, Reynolds Woodcock uh, has in his life. Uh, whereas the food in Honeydew is shot in a way where it looks delicious, but because we suspect something is afoot. In, in my review, I referred to, you know, that feeling when you're in someone else's house and it's a clean house, but it's a different type of clean than you're mm -hmm. used to. Uh, it really captures that well, and it does so through the way that the food is shot. Um, yeah, that's a, uh, but man, the, the food in Phantom Thread is just, when they sit down for breakfast every day, even if it's just an egg, I just salivate over it. It's, it's unbelievable. And also it's, it was, it's super sinister, though the way mm -hmm. that it's fried, like when she's frying oh, stuff up and getting the mushrooms and getting everything ready, there's just something about the way in which it's shot and the sound. Mm-hmm that well, that's really... the uh what's his name johnny greenwood did yeah. the uh score from radiohead it's... and he did some magic there yeah that film is is something have you seen uh anima it's called no it's on netflix it's about 15 minutes long it's a short film directed by paul thomas anderson that is a visual music piece set to tom york of radiohead his song anima and uh, highly recommend. You should take 15 minutes out of your life tonight. It'll probably take a half hour out of your life because you're going to want to watch it again. Twice. <laughs> but it's Paul Thomas Anderson doing a music video, a long form music video, you know, like thriller style and doing so, I believe it was shot digitally. And he's typically somebody who shoots on film, but he can really do anything. And, and it's proof. Highly recommend Anima. And listeners, if you have Netflix, put on Anima. It's, it's really, it'll take no time at all. And you're going to love the filmmaking. It's a great tune too. I will definitely check it out 
tonight. Please, I saw a chat came through. Someone oh. said that they saw Cat's Eye at the drive-in. Um, oh, Jesse, whoever put yeah. that in, if you're still listening, and that was the Mahoning drive-in, I just got to give you the double thumbs up. <laughs> uh, we discovered the Mahoning drive-in a few years back, Jenna and I, and we make a trip out there every year, especially uh, in the age of quarantine. The Mahoning drive-in was about to go under. They are an all uh, rep screening cinema and all film uh, uh, drive-in theater, and they were about to go under. Wouldn't you know it, there's no better social distance safe mm -hmm. activity than a drive-in movie theater and so Mahoning is now thriving and shout out to the yep oh, that was, uh, <laughs> yep yes yes Jesse. shout out to Mahoning they are now thriving it's the best place to go uh it's about two hours out from Philly if you can take the trip go do it and then also the Philadelphia Film Society has the drive-in at the Navy Yard mm -hmm. and uh if you're you know if, while we're still social distancing you can have the theatrical experience and you can do it at a drive-in. If there's a silver lining to this awful thing that we've all, you know, we've all been, you know, doing our best to live through, it's that the drive-in's back, baby. And man, seeing mm. a, you know, I, I saw last summer, I saw the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a rural horror in the middle of a wide open field out in Western PA at the Mahoning. And it, it's one of my favorite film going experiences I've ever had. So that's that's been one of the coolest things about quarantine is that the drive-in is back. I hope it never leaves. Yeah, yeah. That and relaxed open container laws. I hope they never leave either. Well, Dan, it's been a real pleasure. <laughs> Thanks. No, it has. It, Thank I you guess, so much for I having love, me. This a lot was of great. Other questions for you that I'll just you know we'll save for another time. But but sure, best sure. to you and everything you're doing and everybody check out his work uh, all over and um, I can't wait to see your horror anthology. Ah, thank you. I can't wait to see it either. I hope it comes <laughs> out. Hope it comes out decent. Hope it's enjoyable. Uh, I I'm betting on it. Yeah. I'm trying. Well, thank you so much. This was thanks, awesome. Dan. This is so yeah. cool. Take care. You too. And thanks to all of you for staying with us just a few extra minutes while we wrap up that conversation. I hope you'll join us next week where it's our first week of Philly Theater Week and we're going to be talking to Greg DeCandia and Kate Brennan next week who are the uh, founders of Ignition Arts here in Philadelphia. They have, or creators, they're partners, they're creators, they're artists, they're teachers, and they have a lot of energy and excitement in the way they approach their art. And uh, it's gonna be a great conversation. So I hope you join us next Saturday at 5 p.m. Until then, just have a safe week ahead. I hope you're getting out and uh, doing all the things that you've wanted to do um, over time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week at 5 p.m. on Into the Absurd. Be well. Thank you.